When researching any exhibition on Scottish art, the subject of landscape is rarely far away. Scotland's geologically diverse land continues to shape and influence our culture, as seen in the many forms of art that explore the subject, from painting to poetry, writing and music. Lines from Scotland in a modest way reflects that. The artists from the exhibition I will highlight are Elizabeth Blackadder, Wilhelmina Barnes Graham, Andy Goldsworthy, Ian Hamilton Finlay and Carol Rhodes. All artists, or the artists' estates, have been generous in lending images of some additional works to give deeper insight into individual artists' approach. I have also included reference to, and some images of, works by other artists beyond the exhibition to suggest the immense scale of this fascinating topic in Scottish culture. Sometimes we use the words land and landscape interchangeably to describe the physical land that surrounds us. But, as Malcolm Andrews points out in his book, Landscape and Western Art, the word landscape describes mediated land, land that has been aesthetically processed. It is a mental conversion of one thing into another. The creation of Scottish landscape by artists whether in the form of a painted or drawn image, designed garden, earthwork, photograph or film, both reveals and invites us, as Andrews suggests, to consider further the nature of our relationship to and experience of land. From the 18th century onwards, the conversion of Scottish land into Scottish landscape, mostly in the form of drawings, watercolours and easel painting, and prints began to get into its stride. Ranging from the carefully structured early views by painters such as Alexander Runciman to the popular engravings by John Clark of Eldon amongst others. The sense of enlightenment order that prevailed in these compositions still seems present in this much later work, a Kerwin Press print by Elizabeth Blackadder, Dark Hill Fife, in the collection of National Galleries Scotland. Following the Victorian cult of epic depictions of highland crags and torrents, exemplified by painters such as Horatio Cullach, the 20th century heralded a more intimate personal vision of land. The light-filled, French-influenced Iona painting of the early 20th century by S.J. Peplow and his fellow colourists, for example, evoked a sense of being in a physical place, not just viewing it from afar something which was given a new intensity by the immersive physicality of works by painters such as Joan Eardley in the 1950s and early 1960s. Mostly we associate the tradition of landscape painting with rural settings devoid of people. The focus is on the aesthetic or sensory qualities of land, whether found in East Lothian, Glencoe, Iona or Catiline. And the skill of many of these painters is that they, in very different ways, have given expressive form to the particular geology and climate of Scotland. And part of that skill, certainly from the 20th century on, is, as Scottish art historian Guy Peplow suggested in a recent conversation, found in the artist's ability to suggest the vitality of the constantly shifting light, shade and material qualities of the natural world through the medium of a fixed mark. One artist who achieved memorable distillation of the energy and movement of the natural world through line was Wilhelmina Barnes Graham. Active throughout the second half of the 20th century in both St Ives and St Andrews and represented by three works in the show. As she said in a 1992 Crawford Arts Centre catalogue, being in the presence of the power of nature, be it to study the effect of sun on glaciers in Switzerland or the wind movements on sand in Fife. All these wonders emphasise the realisation of the importance of being at one with nature, a contemplation or sensing out, feeling certain rhythms. Barnes Graham visited the Grindelwald Glacier in Switzerland in 1949 with the Brotherton family, which catalyzed an extraordinary series of drawings and paintings on the subject throughout the 1950s, and she revisited the 
theme regularly in subsequent decades. Glacier's Snout from 1976 and this more direct study of splintered ice in a puddle from 1987. The element of water also appears in myriad drawings the artist made of the surge of tide and wave. Perhaps it is no surprise that in a land penetrated by the sea all along the coast and sculpted by ice through time, that these subjects should interest a Scottish artist such as Barnes Graham. Yet, an immersion in this sensory vision of landscape, as John Berger comments, risks masking the reality of the human relationships that have shaped the land. A complex interaction of natural resource, climate, social structure, ownership and use. The inclusion of images of archaeological drawings from the Historic Environment Scotland Canmore Archive and archaeological books in the exhibition, books such as John Hunter's The Small Isles and Ian Fisher's book on early medieval sculpture, reminds us that Scotland has been for millennia an inhabited land. Scottish historian Fiona Watson in her book A History of Scotland's Landscapes tells of the way that her eyes were open to the idea that this land is tattooed with reminders of its past. The drawing and prints of artist Francis Walker included in the exhibition gives one compelling approach to the depiction <coughs> of this tattooed land in Scottish art through her detailed observation of beaches, dry stone walls and rock formations from her series Uninhabited Islands. In the contemporary world, we are keenly aware of how destructive some of the human shaping of land has been, and how alienated we have become from the natural world. This 1940s print, Industrial Landscape Glasgow, from the collection of Aberdeen Art Gallery by artist and master printmaker Ian Fleming, makes dramatic and graphic use of line to evoke a sense of a darker, more uncomfortable relationship to land. As does this unsentimental recording of the slag heap from the 1930s by the same artist. The unsettling quality of Fleming's work prefigures the very different work in the exhibition, a set of drawings by Glasgow artist Carol Rhodes. Both artists, at a 50-year interval, show a land ever more sculpted, less by the power of water and ice, and more by the human interventions of building cities, industrial processes, mining and mass transport. Two contemporary Scots who have, through the medium of aerial photography, called particular attention to the marks left by human land use and the environmental challenges this ha highlights a Patricia and Angus MacDonald, with their immense, decades-long artistic, social and environmental project, Aerographica. They have, in some ways, been pioneers of the 21st century environmentalist approach to defining landscape in Scottish art, blending aesthetic purpose with scientific, documentary approaches in order to stimulate awareness of social and environmental concerns. Aerial photography was one of the sources for exhibitor Carol Rhodes's images. The flattened perspective and high viewpoint of the original medium is given a different life in both her drawings and paintings of contemporary Scottish edge lands. Land as edge land is a working world of infrastructure serving contemporary human life. Road junctions, airfields, distribution centres, quarries, retail parks. We rely on them but much of what they look and feel like, or even their very existence, is hidden from us and would rarely figure if we were asked to call to mind an image of Scottish landscape. In Rhodes's work, the distancing perspective of the aerial photograph becomes translated through careful marks in pencil and paint into a potent metaphor for the sense of alienation and distance that is revealed in this relationship to land. Rhodes was not, however, making a record of particular places. Her drawings transposed elements of different sites. They were places of the imagination as well as experienced worlds. No artist's drawing is a literal topography, but also an imaginative space. 
As critic Moira Jeffrey puts it, Rhodes's work is a world imagined, a place of the mind. For many years, Rhodes saw her drawings just as working documents or cartoons for the paintings, but eventually allowed them to be displayed as autonomous objects. The drawings have a ghost-like presence, as though in itself a metaphor for the fading relationship we have with the natural world. As her gallerist Andrew Mummery memorably, memorably put it, land in Carol Rhodes's paintings becomes a kind of socio-topographical diagram spelling out the structure of human interaction with nature. Rhodes was due to be the subject of a major show at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery this summer 2020, curated by Andrew Mummery, now postponed. But you can read more about the artist and his curatorial project here. Ian Hamilton Finlay created his own landscape famously, in the form of his garden Little Sparta in the Lanarkshire Hills. A leading member of the concrete poetry movement in the 1960s, Finlay explored his ideas about the relationship between man, land and culture in numerous forms, working with collaborators to create stone inscriptions, books, sculpture and pamphlets. All of his works, including the garden itself, come alive through lines drawn on different surfaces. We were able to bring together four examples of Hamilton Finlay's work at St Andrew's Museum and in the exhibition. A folded book and postcard and screen print produced with graphic designer Ron Costley and a tapestry woven with Edinburgh Stuffcoat Studios. Each object represents the same image and text, BCK 35 Pro M, in a different form. The repetition of the image across scale and contrasting materials reveals something of the specific qualities of each. The subtle texture of fine tapestry weaving, the bold graphic qualities of the print, which, when seen together, also encourages us to focus on the text and read and reread it like a poem. One senses the origin of written language as drawn lines in a very physical way. BCK 35 are the letters used to denote the home port of origin of a fishing boat, in this case Bucky in Aberdeenshire. The word proem plays on the words prow poem. In 1991, the artist is quoted as saying that clarity, lyricism and love of the ordinary were central to his work. Another exhibitor in lines is the sculptor Andy Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy is internationally renowned for his work with the materials of and the conditions found in the natural world. Living and working in rural Dumfrieshire since the late 1980s, Goldsworthy has travelled the world in his quest to explore the nature of his physical relationship to land and the potential of an art of landscape, creating as he travels often ephemeral works stitched together from leaves, carved into ice, constructed from fallen branches. These persist only as photographic records once the natural processes that formed them returned them to the earth, or time and weather unpicks them as it does abandoned buildings. The passage of time, the constant change of natural processes underpin his work. The show includes three still photographs and a recent video from his Frost Shadow series. The artist stands motionless from dawn on a cold morning. As the sun rises, his shadow is cast on the frosted ground. And as the sun appears and melts the frost, the shadow of his body remains as a fleeting mark of his presence. The juxtaposition of high def definition video and high quality prints of this process allows the viewer to share something of the artist's experience and understand our complex relationship to a land in a very direct, almost visceral way. In some way, this artist's work seems to sum up something of the tension between man and land and the cultural expression of landscape. We have the potential to influence and alter the shape of the land around us, to make marks and to create these images, these landscapes. But our relationship to land is constantly in flux. 
like the natural world itself, and our own presence, whatever marks we leave behind, is fleeting. I'd like to finish by showing a recent work by Andy Goldsworthy, seen publicly in these ten images for the first time. The artist this spring, unable to travel to fulfil a commission in the USA, has created this compelling emphasis of a line across the land, suggesting all the tattoos, the marks of human presence, as well as the fleeting nature of our relationship.